This brings me to a point about trying to help people in your life, because we all have people in our lives that are struggling in some way. Yeah. And our knee jerk response is to get in there and fix solve it. the problem. Well, yeah, yeah. This is a problem that men often have when they're dealing with women. Yeah, yeah. They, they leap to the problem solution phase. And they also do that in some ways to avoid, and this is what annoys women, because what the women want, and they don't even know this, but this is what the women want. Women are more sensitive to threat than men. Okay, so they're looking for predators. Now, predation detection is a, it's an intuition. Anxiety is an intuition. Something's wrong. Okay, what? Well, then you guess, right? So imagine the threat system has sort of, got something in its sights, but it, it's a, a sense that something's not right, but it's not fully fleshed out the picture because serpents are camouflaged, right? So the threat is hidden. Well, what the woman wants is to lay out all the things that might be wrong. Okay, well, the guy doesn't want that because first of all, you know, maybe your wife is upset about something in relationship to your children and she doesn't know what it is. So now she has to go through everything she thinks that might be wrong. Well, for, even for you to listen, that's going to be rough because some of those things are going to be about you. And so you just have to shut up and you have to let her put her cards on the table. Understanding. Now, she has to do it in good faith, right? She can't be using that opportunity to skewer you. And so these things are tricky to manage, but you want to listen to her lay all the cards on the table. Now, the advantage to that is now you know where all the hidden snakes are. Now, if you do that, what you'll find out, and so will she, is that most of the things that she's worried about, she's not actually worried about. She won't know that until she lays them out on the table and can see them. And then both of you can triangulate to the actual problem, and then you can negotiate a solution and off to offer help. But if you jump right to help, the reason you can't do that is because you, you probably have the problem wrong. Mm. So, so then back to your question about helping, one of the most effective things you can do to help people is to listen. And there are technologies of listening. And so the first one is don't assume that either you or the person who's talking knows what the problem is. It's so hard. Once you have the problem specified, you've solved like 95% of the problem. It's re that diagnostic move is really hard. Are we sure we're addressing the most crucial issue? You have to have your sights focused right on the center point of the cross, right? Like in a, in a gun sight. It's like, are we aiming at the right target? And then you can start negotiating problem solution. And so, so it's, but you can develop the patience to do that once you understand that that initial act of listening is in itself the most helpful thing you can do. Just listen. And then how do you listen? Okay, so if I'm listening to you, there'll be times when what you're saying doesn't make sense. And so then I'll just say, well, you're saying this mm -hmm. now, but you said this five minutes ago. And if you listen a lot, you can learn to track conversations across a very long span of time. And that's quite fun. You said this, but then you said this, and they don't like they seem contradictory to me. You're not accusing the person. You're saying, I see an inconsistency in the way you're formulating the problem. And they'll sort of startle a little bit and then try to rectify that. They'll check you out to see if you're insulting them or trying to play a game of moral superiority first. But if it's just an honest question, then you're actually helping them lay out a description of the situation that's not internally contradictory. Okay, so and the great podcasters do this. You see this with Rogan. You know, all Rogan does is ask stupid questions. Mm. And the way he does that is by consulting with his own ignorance in humility. Rogan is listening. He's thinking, I'm a stupid lunkhead and I don't understand this. What do you mean? And the, what's, that's brave because he's exposing his own ignorance. But it's, it's honest because he doesn't understand. But it also unites him with his audience because especially with someone like Rogan, the probability at this time that if Rogan doesn't understand the gist of the conversation that 95% of his audience doesn't understand is, it's like 100%. The importance of listening can't possibly be overstated. Listen, ask questions until you understand. And by doing that, you also help the other person clarify the situation. It is so hard to do. And I, I think we have to just pause at that step because 
it is, as you said, you said like that's 95% of the challenge. Mm -hmm. It is so hard to do in relationships, in work. I've sat literally at this table with a colleague of mine about a year ago and she was telling me, she works in one of my companies. She was telling me that she's unhappy in her role. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting here and she gave me a bunch of reasons why. And I kept asking and asking questions. And after just 30 minutes of asking the questions, she had decided that in fact, everything she had just said was not the issue. And then it related back to a much more fundamental issue of just meaning right, right. in her work. See, well, yeah. see, see, okay, well, that's very important. That's very important. Jung called that a circumambulation. Okay, so now imagine the threat system is going off, right? It's saying something's wrong, something's wrong. But it it's just, it's an it's a primordial pre predator, predator detection instinct. That's what's being triggered. It isn't high resolution, it isn't capable of high resolution conceptual formulation, not to begin with. Something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. Okay, what? Maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe. Okay, now what happens is the, the maybes circle and spiral, right? And as you lay them out, you spiral inward to the gist of the matter. But you have to see, because you could imagine while this woman is explaining her problems to you, she's talking about things about the company and her relationship with the company that might be unsettling to you. So you're sitting there thinking while she's laying out her problems, maybe you're getting defensive. Well, that's not true. The company's better than that. That's an unfair accusation. So you're feeling on the spot. Plus you want to jump in with your, you know, with your solution because you want to show that you're bigger than the problem that she's showing her. Maybe you're secretly attracted to her and you want to be a white knight. I mean, there can be 50 things. You're sitting there thinking about what you're going to say next because you want to play dominance or maybe you think that's what you should do because you're a boss. And it's like, there's a lot of things that will interfere with listening. But, but so you learn, you say, just shut up, ask stupid questions until really, until the person that you're listening to has specified the problem. Now, if you're very fortunate, both of you will converge on that and it'll just become clear. Think, oh, you, and you pointed this out. This is what that's really all about. Now, the person may be discovering too that they were resistant to that conclusion. They, you know, because the fundamental threat is more key to their self-esteem that they, to their conception of themselves than allowed them to be comfortable before they get to the actual point which is where they're going to be most vulnerable. They're going to throw out a bunch of screen concerns just to see if you can be trusted with something that will reveal their vulnerability. And they're even doing that to themselves. It's like, dare I tell the truth about this situation because I've betrayed myself before, so maybe not. You're so right. Uh, they, yeah. they test you to the, on the way to the truth to see if how you'll respond. Yes, oh, and they're testing themselves yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, and you can facilitate that. See, if you facilitate that by calm listening, then you're modeling the fact that whatever the hell they have as a problem isn't so terrifying that you have to avoid it and run away. Yeah. Right, right. It's so interesting what, what was actually revealed because this person that works in one of my marketing teams in a different company where there's a CEO said to me, um, it's the work, she, they were doing that was causing them the the unease and that's the reason they wanted to leave etc and i asked them the question after about 30 minutes when was the time you were most happy in the mm -hmm. in the business mm -hmm. they revealed to me that the time they were most happy was when they were with me overseas at the very beginning and what that really revealed at, at its essence was there'd been a change in the proximity to me and the real meaning of the work. Mm -hmm. And they now felt like they were doing trivial things. Their happiest time was when they were right next to me doing the most important stuff. Right. The mo so the most difficult problems. Yeah, they yeah, were solving yeah. the most yes. difficult problems. When they were most challenged right. and they were, they were, so really the fix wasn't what they thought it was, the fix. And then now they actually text me. I sent the message to one of my team members last night saying, I just don't want to, I want to keep, yeah, keep yeah. their identity. So, yeah. so let's say they were with me in Canada. They text me when they were most happy. They text me last night saying, I feel like Canada Jenny again. Right, And all right. the adjustment that had to be made was getting them back close to bigger challenges. Right. So they wanted to be closer to the front line as it turned out. When Freud first developed psychotherapy, he developed this technique of free association. Okay, so all free association is, and this is what Freud, this is why people put, Freud put people on the couch and sat be, behind them. See, if I'm face to face with you and I'm laying out the problem space, 
just what you're signaling to me by your face might stop me from fully revealing the truth because maybe you'll raise an eyebrow or you, there'll be a micro um, expression of disgust or contempt or you'll look away or because I'm going to be evaluating you to see how you're reacting morally to my revelations. So Freud just hit himself. Mm. He said, and, and I, I don't think that's strictly necessary, but 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 it's a very wise intuition and you can imagine how it would be helpful. So now I think the counter to that is you can signal to someone who you're talking to like open reception of the message they're receiving, right? It's just that, and kids love this, right? One of the things kids are doing all the time is testing you to see if you're paying attention and they will modify their behavior in any way imaginable to get attention. There's no, it's because there's no difference between attention and love, by the way, like there's no difference. And so I don't think you have to hide yourself from your client, but that's why Freud did it. Now, what Freud noticed and the psychoanalysts noted is, is that if you let people free associate, the, the topics that they picked would be linked to one another. That reminds me of this. That reminds me of this. That reminds me of this. Now, obviously, because people aren't just emitting random noises, there's a reason the things they're revealing are linked. There's some implicit similarity that they're striving toward. Now, often what'll happen if you listen to your wife, for example, she's laying out a bunch of problems and it'll spiral. It'll remind her of something, this, off, this happened with Freud. If you got to the gist of it, it would remind people of something that happened to them much earlier in their life and often something that was traumatic. That, so a trauma is a problem you encounter in your life that's quite deep so that it unsettles you that you do not resolve. So it's like, it, imagine that in your bedroom, there were holes that you could fall through into, you know, in, into trouble. Mm. And so you want to make a map of where all the holes are so that you can walk through the landscape without falling into the pit. Now it'd be better if you just fixed the holes, but, but at least you have the landscape mapped out. Well, a trauma is a, a trauma is a hole that hasn't been filled in. And so maybe you, if you had a trauma when you were four, you hit a wall and be, you couldn't resolve the trauma, that's no different than not maturing in relationship to that problem. So what you have at hand there are the, only the tools that you developed by the time you were four. Now then you might encounter a situation where that's reminiscent of that. So for example, someone might say, I had a problem with my boss. I have a recurring problem with my boss. And so you listen to me, he says, that, that reminds me exactly of what my father did when I, you know, in this situation when I was a kid. And so the reason the person is reacting to their boss in a negative way is because they're using the same conceptual structure that they used to construe their father when they were four. You'll see this in marriages all the time. Like if you have a recurring problem with your partner that's, that, that, that you really can't understand, now, it might be your fixation at some developmental stage that's the problem. Like, she's interacting with you in a way that elicits your 13-year-old self consistently. But she also might be reacting to you in a way that elicits her 13-year-old self. And so then, but if you listen to her, she'll get to that. And then she'll tell you the story, and then... Sometimes she'll be able to figure out what to do about that herself, or sometimes you'll have to discuss it, but it almost always results in tears, almost always. And I think the reason for that is think that what happens is when people break down in tears, so children cry quite often, and they cry when they encounter an impediment that they can't surmount. And I think what tears do is dissolve you to the state of neurological plasticity that characterizes early childhood so that you can learn. Now, people don't like that, right? That reversion, it's humiliating, but you know, you have to break. That's the crying. Mm -hmm. the, the crying is an indication that the current conceptual structure is insufficient. It has to die. And then the tears come, right? And then now you're prepared neurologically to learn something new. And that'll be whatever comes out of the discussion. And that'll replace that old conceptual structure that's outdated and immature with a new, somewhat fragile conceptual structure, right? And then the person will try that out a couple of times. Like maybe you 
this is something where you have to, it's like something that's just come out of a cocoon. You have to be very careful when you negotiate with your partner because, you know, maybe they'll decide that they'll try a new tactic that you, you have both agreed on. But the first 30 times they implement that new tactic, first of all, they won't do it very well because mm -hmm. it's new. And second, if you punish it, it'll kill it right away. 